What's your escape route? Sorry, old man. Section 26, paragraph 5. That information is on a need-to-know basis only. Well, I say you need to know whether or not The Living Daylights was good. Hi, I'm Kevin from the SDP, and this is the 007 Diamond Jubilee. Our story starts in Czechoslovakia, where 007 is overseeing the defection of a Soviet official. A rival sniper shows herself and he shoots her gun instead of killing her, but otherwise the escape goes off without a hitch. That is, until he pays a visit to an MI6 safe house in the English countryside, where he divulges rumors about the reactivation of the KGB's Smirsch program, only to undefect. The chase goes on through Slovakia, Austria, Morocco, and Afghanistan to uncover the truth about Smirsch. I've had a few optional extras installed. With lead actor Roger Moore bowing out of the franchise, in 1986 the search was on for a new James Bond. Among those considered was the Irish-born actor Pierce Brosnan, fresh off the TV detective series Remington Steele. But in the end, the role went to Timothy Dalton, a Welsh veteran of the Shakespeare circuit, who brought with him a more serious, cold, and professional take on the role of 007. And I'm willing to brand myself as an outcast by saying that Dalton was an underrated actor and, in fact for a while, was my favorite James Bond actor that's ever been. He only starred in two of the Bond films and The Living Daylights wasn't the one that sealed the deal for me, but with a complex script like what we've got here, it would be a little uncomfortable to imagine Moore or even Connery tackling it with the same gravitas. True, Dalton wouldn't fit in as well with the classic high-flying Bond scenarios, but for the material he's given, Dalton acts it well. The Slovak sniper from the defection is Kara Milovi, also a classical cellist. Like Tracy from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, she's one of those Bond girls with whom 007 builds an honest to blog romance. I especially love how intrinsically she's woven into the plot. Take note of how she was set up as the sniper for the fake defection in the hopes she would get killed, or how she has 007 drugged whilst under the impression that he is a KGB agent. Organizing the defection is Saunders, an MI6 operative stationed in neighboring Austria. Saunders is highly critical of Bond, from his sparing the female sniper during the defection, to his plan for getting the man out of Czechoslovakia, or lack thereof. Normally, this plays out to my personal annoyance, and Saunders is no exception, but to spoil as little as possible, it's nice to see him go out on a friendly note. As with For Your Eyes Only, I'm not revealing the specific villain, as an unexpected switch-up occurs midway, much in the vein of that other film. So, I will merely state that there is a power struggle between Georgi Koskov, a Soviet general, and Leonid Pushkin, Gogol's replacement as head of the KGB. The true villain is deliciously manipulative, in particular for the way he tries to sacrifice his own girlfriend for his plan. As for their acting, Koskov gives neither the most serious or even sane performance in the film, whereas Pushkin is played by John Rice davies aka Gimli, so enough said. Working in cahoots with a villain is Brad Whitaker, an American arms dealer seeking to trade with the Soviets in Afghanistan. His home base is a showroom and miniature museum of war history. Not the most grounded of ideas, but it helps paint his character as a die-hard war aficionado. As for the actor himself, if he absolutely has to sound like a burrish Southern American, then he's what J.W. Pepper should have been like. The theme song is performed by AHA, and the way I see it, this song was engineered to replicate the success of Duran Duran's theme from A View to a Kill. Except that the lyrics suggest that the lights were on in the writer's heads, but no one was home. Seriously, when the chorus of your song is nothing but the title phrase repeated with no other context, you may be on track to owning one of the worst theme songs of all time. Still, if you need to know an AHA song besides Take On Me, then enjoy the hipster cred, I guess. The opening credits use a lot of water and colored lighting. This sequence evokes the credit scenes of the 70s and early 80s in that it's sensual but not very interesting. Also, there's something I must address. Given that the last act of this film concerns itself with the Soviet war in Afghanistan, it has been publicly noted that James Bond allied with the Mujahideen, a faction which in the real world would evolve into the Taliban in a few years' time. Well, that's not the whole truth. The Mujahideen splintered into a number of groups once their common enemy, the Soviet Union, left in 1989. 
The Taliban was part of that, yes, but other offshoots include the Northern Alliance tribes, which assisted the NATO coalition in deposing the Taliban in 2001. In case you haven't noticed by now, The Living Daylights hosts, by my judgment, the most complex plot of any of the James Bond films. Here are some hints to help you sort through it all. Kara is initially the villain's girlfriend. Pushkin wants Koskov out of office for embezzlement, and Koskov spreads lies about him to fight back, and Whitaker bought opium from the Afghan tribes in order to make more money than from trading weapons alone. With those pointers in tow, I would highly recommend this otherwise lesser-known entry. I wouldn't advise you to start out with it, but once you acclimate yourself to the franchise, you simply must get to it at some point. The Living Daylight scores 80% a B. Must have scared the living daylights out of her.